Hello and welcome to the podcast. We have today the one and only S.G. Anon, who we are very blessed as always every month to have, uh, who is making a return engagement. And we've got some uh, good questions to ask him. He's going to be giving us a good uh, summation on the geopolitical and financial uh, situation as it relates to both the U.S. and the world as always. So, S.G., thanks for joining us again, brother. We're honored to have you. Honored to be back, John. Thank you for having me. Likewise. Okay, so SG, um, I'm going to start right off the bat with some interesting stuff. Putin and Xi, as you know, met over the weekend. Meanwhile, we have China-Taiwan looming in the distance. Um, beyond working together in the BRICS system, do you believe that they're also working together on the China-Taiwan invasion initiative? And if so, at this point, with everything kind of starting to build, when do you anticipate that to happen? You know, it's a really good and salient point, John, and it's a good way to start our conversation today because a lot of patriots are starting to realize, wait a minute, this thing with the with the U.S. dollar and the worldwide financial system and changeover, that's that's probably actually real. You're starting to get a lot of normies that are coming around acknowledging that the behavior of Iraq, the behavior of Zimbabwe, the behavior of the Myanmar government, Thailand, others, um, it's heralding a much broader shift. And the BRICS nations, specifically China and Russia, I believe in league uh, privately in the background with President Trump and whatever lawful U.S. government representation is happening there, they are spearheading the movement to iron out cooperation and have been for a long time, cooperation at that financial, technological, and increasingly more militarized. I think the meeting that we just saw recently in conjunction with the loyalty oath that was just required from all of the citizenry of North Korea reaffirmed to Kim Jong-un, I believe, at the end of March, first part of April, this, I think, is heralding a broader military cooperation than just the Taiwan campaign or just the Ukraine war. I think both nations implicitly understand that with their uh, geopolitical cooperation, specifically infrastructurally and resource wise, that both nation states can independently handle and and execute and see to whatever military campaigns are on their, you know, on their chopping block, so to speak. I think the meeting that occurred between um Putin and G, other than the publicly proclaimed reasons, and we all know sort of the same similar constellations, right? But I think a major core tenet of that meeting that was not discussed, and I'm actually going to talk about this a little bit in File 75, was what happens with the North Korean uh, landscape and countryside with a North Korean campaign into South Korea. I think we're actually going to see war on the Korean Peninsula as well as with Taiwan in the Pacific region before this is over, the elimination of the 38th parallel. Uh, in that process, I think is going to happen. And that will you know, inevitably result in a final conclusion to the warfare campaign uh, that was that was launched by the North Korean communists at the hands of Mao in the early 1950s. So, you know, looking at what we've got going on right now, Russia has a strategic interest in North Korea's behavior, especially with their uh, intercontinental ballistic missile capabilities. Russian aircraft and assets are constantly over the Pacific monitoring everything from the Alaska identification zone coming out of North America and the U.S. Missiles are a concern in that theater, <clears throat> excuse me, and have been used and referenced uh, by Q at least a couple of different times. So I think you've got um, interest from Russia on what happens with that. Please pardon the noise in the background. And you've got uh, interest from China also on what happens with that, probably even more so to, to a greater expanded degree because North Korea is a dark money pool that has to be brought out into the world. And the Chinese, along with the and, and their dragon families, along with uh, other very old uh, ancestral caretakers of cultural wealth over the last, say, 50 to 100 years, they're very interested in dragging out all of those dark money pools and getting them accounted for so that we can revert the world and, and draw in and re-implement a financial system that is more uh, e equality focused and certainly more fair regarding value exchange. So I know it's a really long answer to the question, but all of these events are sort of related, the financial campaign, the technological campaign, the military campaign and cooperations, the diplomatic ties. You know, why was Blinken, for example, in China less than a month ago? Uh, why do we have individuals, you know, Xi, I believe, was in Paris just very recently. You know, why are these events occurring? I believe these events are occurring because they are heralding uh, foundational discussions for geopolitical arrangements that are going to um, essentially create the the construct and the landscape to remove the old financial manipulation system worldwide and bring in a, a new one. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're, you're absolutely right, uh, SG, that the events are cyclical and correlate very, they marry together quite well. As a matter of fact, just a little drop for you, you probably already know this, but uh, Judge Torres, who is the presiding judge in the Ripple XRP case against the corrupt SEC, uh, it looks like uh, at some point this month, she's going to get ready to make her decision, which we believe is clearly going to be in the favor of XRP as they've done no malfeasance. And that's going to set upon a blaze for not just the crypto space, but also you know foreign currencies, bonds, uh, the metals, and everything that pertains to it. Because as you said, it all correlates nicely. So it's really exciting to see this take uh, focus and shape. And to your point, when you and I first spoke months ago, you had said, if I remember correctly, that you felt that there was going to be a big movement in the uh, the financial aspect of things to include Nasara within the first six of, six months of the year, and we're now coming up to that tipping point. So it seems to be ringing true uh, from everything that we can start to see, you know, cycling out into the the mainstream front of things. Um, so the next question I want to ask you as a follow up to that, SG, is uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but a Chinese mining, excuse me, a Chinese mining uh, camp opened up a $300 million lithium processing plant in Zimbabwe, as they have the world's largest metal reserves, including gold. Um, China also paid off nearly 68 billion in loans for Zimbabwe in order to get them onto the BRICS and uh, get access to said gold. Um, in terms of you know being part of a much larger arrangement uh, to get their Zimbabwe bonds and Zig dollars up to par on gold with QR codes, um, do you? I think you touched on this in the first part of the comment, but do you see this as an important uh, integration as far as Zimbabwe coming back onto the international stage? I honestly see this, uh, John, and pardon the severe weather in the background. If you hear some, I'm in an area right now that I think is getting targeted with some atmospheric disturbance. But sure, um, with regards to the the rollout of Zimbabwe in the world stage, I think you're seeing the opening salvo of that actually happening right now. I think you're seeing the the attempt at revaluation rolling out into those foreign exchange markets from the Zimbabwean government and the Iraqi government, actually, sort of in real time. I've had photographs passed to me from um, foreign exchange traders where they have actually snapshotted Iraqi dinar valuations as 3.9 dinar per one U.S. dollar, 3.4 dinar per one U.S. dollar. And then they would follow up these reports by saying that the, that the uh, exchange rate goes back to the old rate when they reload the app. So we're seeing, I think, beta testing, stress testing, if you will, a foreign RV style situation occurring. Zimbabwe and the activities that have recently been taken with regards to the ZIG, uh, the announcement of the ZIG, and also the, the concurrent law enforcement activities occurring within that country to destroy black market currency manipulators, and they actually utilize those terms. Um, I find that very compelling and very fascinating. You know, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, Malaysia, Iraq, Brazil, Venezuela, these are, you know, Iran, uh, Turkey, Taiwan, these are nations that a lot of people don't realize, and Israel too, don't realize are heavily connected. Uh, they're very, very important junction points in the worldwide commerce and value exchange financial market system that we currently live in. And we can't bring the system down prior to purging the junctions, or we'll just end up with the exact same corruption uh, infesting itself into whatever new largesse system we overlay in that international community and in that, in that international stage. So the purging, I think, is occurring now openly in Iraq, in Zimbabwe. It's been occurring in Myanmar for a couple of years. Thailand recently announced activity with a gold-backed currency. South Africa is exploring, excuse me, legislation on this. Venezuela is attempting to get its hands on gold, same as Brazil. So you're seeing a lot of, um, of desperation. I, I guess desperation is a good way to say it. Certainly focused activity uh, with the purging of these these um, these internal structures to try and restabilize the worldwide system. We've got a worldwide petrodollar that we're destabilizing at the same time that we're trying to keep the underpinning system stable. And that's sort of like trying to take the building off of the foundation, or rather a, a better way to say it would be to take the foundation out from beneath the building and then put a new foundation in its place before the building is able to crumble on itself. 
And so that's a very delicate process that we're going through right now. And I think the the indicators coming out of Zimbabwe and really just the behavior of the African Union as it pertains to currency and trade over the last six months, I think it is the basic rollout in construct, if you will, in framework of a broader asset-backed system that is not exclusively tied to BRICS, but may allow interoperability with BRICS. Yeah, no, 100%. Really, really well said, SG, as always. And, you know, just to add to that before the next question really quickly, you know, you also see the, the corruption happening in Vietnam. They just uh, put a woman to death uh, who was a real estate mogul, uh, 67, um, and the government put her to, to death for $12.5 billion of, of money laundering. Uh, they just had their head of parliament step down. They just announced this week that they're going to be joining BRICS since they've already been w part of the WTO since 2004, as you know, this was sort of inevitable uh, that this was coming. So if people think this is business as usual. It's not. This, this is not another way to dress up corruption. This is a descaling of the old guard to the new, as you, po as you rightly pointed out. Um, so thank you for that. So we know, SG, that this isn't the real Biden in, in D.C. or whatever's left of D.C., but there's all this constant pressure that's mounting on whoever that is by the day. So I guess the, the, the short question is, what do you opine will be the timing and the impetus for whoever that is removal? Do you think it'll be a medical emergency or do you think it'll be something else? You know, honestly, my friend, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, and the audio actually broke up a little bit on your question there. Were you asking about the, the removal of different power positions in society ad hoc, or were you asking about a specific pulpit or a specific person? Sorry about that. Yes, no, I was asking about the Biden. Um, when do you think that whoever that is posing as him will be summarily removed? Oh, okay. Um, you know... John, that's a really, really difficult question, my friend. And the best I can do, I think, is to speculate a little bit on it. I think that we're going to see the removal of Biden happen in disgrace. Um, that disgrace, excuse me, I don't believe is going to be the, the militarized removal that a lot of patriots have talked about. I think that that actually is, is being saved for further deep state actors that the Biden installation is drawing out into the light. Um, but I think what you're going to see with the Biden installation removal, that could very well concur right alongside or happen concurrently, I guess is a better way to say, right alongside a financial event caused by the seeking and you know the rattling and the sabers of the drums of war, along with purposefully destroying the U.S. economy. And we've seen that happen, right? We're, we're living through that process. I think everyone on this call can acknowledge economically the U.S. is decimated compared to where it was just four years ago. With that being said, a, a position would then open itself up where we would have, you know, potentially an ascendancy of Kamala to the chair. I think that uh, I don't rule out, as a matter of fact, that Hillary Clinton is going to get her feet back in the game before this process is all over and may actually be nominated as a potential vice president pick uh, on behalf of a replacement for Biden. Um, and I think you're going to see militarized enforcement at some point. I want to highlight that for patriots out there. I do think that that's coming. But those, that statement and that scenario should never really be made lightly, John, right? When we're talking about the historic implications of what that means, it sets up a precedent for the unleashing of the teeth of the world's most powerful military onto its own population, onto its own electorate. That sets an extraordinarily dangerous precedent worldwide. And we have to be careful about the justification, if any, that we use to move in that, in that fashion. I think what is being done, and one of the things that you're seeing these events happening in the world at the same time that these financial events are occurring, is the constitutional um, allocations and all of the various U.S. code that has not been invalidated through Supreme Court precedent and ruling is being used to expose and then uh, remove various corruption points and various um, um, pulpits that need to be cleaned out. And the Biden installation, I believe, is uh, a part of that and how that moves through. I mean, Trump talked about the 25th Amendment uh, prior to his leaving public office and stated that it's going to be a problem for Joe. Um, Kamala is very quiet and has been for a while. She's not been in the public scene. She's been in the background uh, going to these these small speaking engagements. 
And I look at that and I think to myself, it's oftentimes in a counterintelligence warfare scenario, we see the movement on the battlefield come from the least expected angle, it comes from the least expected arena right out of left field. And so I think the same is actually true here when we're talking about how this installation of Biden is going to get removed. One of the things that I feel very confident in saying is that the removal will be a disgraceful one and will forever mar the legacy. But what happens as a result of that and, and, and with respect to the happening, how it happens, I just don't know as I'm qualified to hardcore speculate. There's a lot of different arenas that we could move down, but I'm looking right now at the constitutional allocations of, or excuse me, the constitutional allowance of the 25th Amendment, as well as a potential military coup to avert a nuclear strike, for example, on the United States homeland. Both of these options, you know, while categorically different, I think they're equally plausible. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, I, and that's all that we can do is kind of do a deep dive speculation because, you know, nobody knows exact time. But I agree with you, just like in life, things happen in phases that we it's not what we see coming. It's what we don't see coming. And that's just the variables that God puts in front of us to have us live in the moment day by day. Right. And in and, and, and the daily bread and whatnot. Um, circling back a minute to the financial point, you put a very important article, SG, I believe it was on your, it was either True Social or X, I can't remember, maybe it was both, but you had a illustration of the 10-year treasury bond yield. That's something that we've been focusing on our side, very closely examining it. We've been talking to people, subject matter experts like Greg Manorino, uh, Jim Willie, Andy Sheckman, and the like. Uh, we're going to have Lynette Zhang on later this month. We'll be talking about the same thing. That's really a very important and underrated uh, aspect of the financial marketplace that people should be taking notice of because as that continues to fail at a certain tipping point that's going to tip over the stock market commercial real estate which is already in process as you know residential real estate and the everyday main street person um, i guess my question would be to two parts is one what do you see that delineation line being and can the fed really what's the tipping point where you think they're not going to be able to uh, to bail out the bond market anymore? You know, a very difficult question. And, I, and I, I'll start the segment by saying I'm not a financial advisor, but this is one of the most important components, I think, for patriots to understand in the overall aspect of the timeline, right? We all, we all have the question, how much longer? How much longer? When will we be at a point that is demonstrable for patriots? When will we have that public infusion of victory, right? And the financial events, I think, are probably going to herald off a period of public acknowledgement of, you know, things that patriots have been talking about for a long time. But it's not exactly going to be an easy process. And it's not without its difficulties. We talked about that a little bit earlier. So the tipping point, which is really what you're referencing here, um, is probably beyond my pay grade. But when I look at the behavior of the U.S. Treasury and relations specifically to China and the amount of Treasury bonds that have been offloaded by the hundreds of thousands per month by the Chinese government, and that process is just accelerating. We're going to arrive at a point where China uh, is, is holding the bag, essentially, for a very, very small amount of U.S. debt relative to what, is, what it has always held before. And the launch of militarized activity in the Pacific will destroy the Japanese economic and industrial marketplace as well, um, which is heavily entrenched in the U.S. markets and is part of the reason that the U.S. Treasury uh, Federal Reserve System is still able to bail out those bonds. So I'm looking at this, I guess, and I'm thinking to myself, there's, there's not really a tipping point, you know, and this is on my own personal opinion. Again, I'm not a subject matter expert in this, but, you know, when I look at the tipping point, what might it be? What might that represent? You know, I think to myself, well, is it is it as simple as an offloading uh, of the of the Treasury bond, you know, from the rest of the world and and back to the United States, sort of tossing that buck back to this corner? Is it that simple or is it a simple matter or is excuse me, is it is a more complex matter of having to drive um, nails into the weak points of that SWIFT system, of that Federal Reserve system at the same time that you are offloading the lifeblood? And I'm more inclined to think that the latter example is true. So when I look at a potential tipping point, I think to myself, when China is clear of 75, 70 to 75% of its overall responsibility for U.S. debt, 
and is also comfortable in its role ancillary to what's happening in the Middle East because China is one of the largest arms dealers in North Africa and in the Middle East right now, eclipsed perhaps only by Iran, uh, which is the world's largest arms dealer. Uh, when China you know, is, is comfortable in all of that and feels that they're ready to move forward with the Taiwanese campaign, I think you're going to see events happen which will paralyze the Federal Reserve System at that point. Uh, so the tipping point, I think, is not necessarily a, a statistical offloading of debt. I think it's more dependent on the behavior of geopolitics. Um, and the Treasury bond from that point, when we see that paralysis, that first shock and awe smack uh, to the Federal Reserve System and the, and the fiat dollar actually happen, I think that's the point where you will see the bravado of most of the rest of the global south, most of the rest of the developing world, where they will say, yeah, and we're done with it, too. And so you'll see a massive event. Oh, my. We're having some sort of emergency alert in my arena. Um, I'll, I'll conclude this segment, John. And if I may, I may have to actually um, uh, look at this continuing for another uh, continuing for another time. Sure. Um, but, you know, with regards to that particular tipping point of the financial system, I don't think it can be overstated that the the treasury yield as you highlighted just a moment ago talking about your program that is one of the main pulses that's a good barometer another good barometer is the behavior of the commercial debt space which is way over leveraged and has been in a an enormous default position since q4 q3 q4 really of 2023 and accelerating um this is this is a very intense time that we're all living right now uh, financially speaking, is certainly one of them. But I think that the point where you're talking about seeing the inversion and where the system actually ends up stopping here at home is going to coincide with the expansion of military hostilities. Yeah, I agree completely. And uh, that is something we're watching very closely. Um, speaking of which, uh, weather fluctuations, you're seeing record temperature swings, floods, and rainfalls throughout the world that you would not normally see, as well as the uptick in earthquakes. Is this purely a DARPA weather manipulation, or do you think this is the Earth kind of shifting and changing to normalize seasons again? Um, a little bit of both, if I may. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that it's to normalize seasons again, although I think that that's part of it. We live under a celestial clock. We're part of a celestial operating mechanism that's very precisely tuned. Um, but I also believe that we're entering into a, a growth point, not only in mankind's spiritual destiny, but in the spiritual future of what the earth itself is going to look like, feel like, be like, you know, what type of flora, what type of fauna, you know, will flourish out there in the, in the world as we go through the generations from this point forward. So I look at the weather and the various, you know, pattern changes that are occurring the geoengineering, which is clearly flagrant, the climate events, which are clearly clearly being used to instigate fear. Um, and I've even heard rumors recently that, you know, the climate itself might be used as an as a reason for the Manchurian Biden to declare some sort of lockdown and institute martial law. And that's not to be sensational, but it is to say that we're living in a clown world and I wouldn't put that past the clowns. The geoengineering component cannot be uh, overstated in its importance. That said, when we look at the awakening and we look at the behavior of the earth and we look at the behavior of nature, we're seeing the sun get brighter. We're seeing the trees get greener. We're seeing the sky get more brilliantly blue. Um, the water out there, you know, regardless of whatever color it may be, whether it's murk, you know, whether it's muddied by the, the murkiness or whether it is crystal clear, it has a vibrance to it that it's not had, you know, any at any point in my life that I can recall. And I don't have perfect eyes, but I have eyes well enough to understand tonality change. So <clears throat> the weather component, I think that you you sort of hinted at a fantastic idea behind some of this. And I think that idea mer has some merit here. The weather component is going to be primarily a symbiotic agreement between the behavior of human civilization and what the earth itself desires. And I think the earth itself is an extension of God's Holy Spirit, just like we are, right? So we have to listen to it in some regards. We have to try and feel it out, if I can use the terminology, uh, not, to, not to wax, uh, you know, sort of uh, hippy-dippy, but it's, it's much more of a um, being cognizant of what your garden needs, for example, or what your animals need, or what the animals in your particular locality may require, or what changes have occurred in the skies 
uh, that are that you know you can that you can say have not been driven by engineering. That's an interesting component to all of this, and it speaks to the Great Awakening process. The Earth Schumann resonance is changing and rising. We have a changeover in consciousness that all of us can feel. The animals can tell. I went to a park just recently, uh, sort of decide to sidetrack here, but to give context to your question, I went to a park just recently and had myself a little bit of a picnic meal, and I had a couple of cashews within that meal. And the squirrels that are at this park uh, in this arena have, and they've been there for a long time in the area that I've lived, um, they've always been comfortable with people, but they've always been sort of a sideline uh, spectators, and they wait until the, the humans are finished with the meals at the park, and then they go in and they raid the scraps. It's actually one of the reasons the locality that I live in has installed anti-rodent devices on some of the trash collectors. So when when I tell you then that just recently I went to this same park, I had some cashews, you know, and, and some other portions of my meal, and one of these squirrels came directly up to the table, jumped up on the table, and walked over to within eight inches of me and picked up a cashew that I had set on the table, separated out from my meal, and then looked at me and walked away. I can assure you that there is a change that has occurred in the behavior of the world and nature is acutely aware of it. And so when you talk about geoengineering, nature is acutely aware of that, but nature I think has adapted to that and, and continued to evolve and grow and thrive you know, in, a, in sort of a vital way, even despite all of that. And I'm extremely excited to see what climactic weather patterns and what true atmospheric behavior um, ends up being once we remove the human manipulation component and we get a little bit more symbiotically balanced with the environment that is around us, right? We don't want to be ineffective at our, at our mission of trying to you know, respect and conserve the earth, but also provide advancement for human civilization. And at the same time, we do want to be cognizant that that's a very important component of, of, I think, our future here in the world and what kind of world we're going to create for our kids. Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. And what Wells said, a good synopsis of how everything in the ecosystem affects the other. And, you know, as always said, it's not what you eat, it's what your food eats. So, yeah, I'm with you there. Uh, President Trump talks about the final battle with six months left in the election, but most people are tired. They can't wait that long or they're having a hard time trying to even see themselves to that end point. Um, do you think that this election is going to wait till November or do you see the military kind of stepping in and intervening long before that point? Um, I don't see this election going to November. I do see us getting potentially all of the way through the summer and into the early parts of the fall, you know, really breathing down the neck of that November election before we see world changing society stopping style events. And we may or may not see those events because, again, I'm, I'm not a prognosticator. I'm just trying to go off of what the research is telling me. And the pattern right now would seem to suggest that we will have something that will stop the election. Now, that being said, you know, what we have going through this final battle that President Trump talks about, I think the final battle is a more multidimensional term than we appreciate. It is, of course, the patriots. It is, of course, we the people versus the deep state corporate cabalist machine. It is um, community, excuse me, levers targeting uh, centralized power and resisting that, right? And that's happening at all arenas, in all arenas of society across all dimensionalities. But it is also a kinetic war. It is also a cleaning out of certain um, uh, territories in Eastern Europe and even the repatriation of certain territories, depending on how some of the geopolitical negotiations during the Trump administration actually went down. It is a, a war of uh, quite literally crashing or getting as close to crashing as we can the financial system of the Western world so that it can be removed and ushered in uh, and replaced and ushered in with a new and better uh, uh, you know, equality focused, um, um, transparent, you know, financial system that is not centered on suffering, but centered on wealth amplification, not just for a singular nation, but in league with other nations as well. It's a kinetic battle in the biological weapon space. We just recently saw and had confirmed for our very eyes the fact that this is a war because we had AstraZeneca announce that they are removing voluntarily of their own accord, supposedly they are removing their rollout of their COVID-19 vaccine worldwide. And so that tells me that uh, one of the main 
howitzers and the biological terrorism complex has submitted. And now we have some sort of future to be had with that. We might see AstraZeneca begin the process, right, of, of reversing some of the um, effects that have, that have been um, you know, put out through these vaccines by publicly acknowledging other you know, components of the, the damage that has not been publicly fleshed out yet. And, and remember, we're, you know, when we talk about final battle, it, it is all of these things, but it is also that spiritual peace as well. You know? So I, I, again, I, I, I hate to wax tangentially, and I do that a lot on air, but it's because when we extract ourselves to an 80,000-foot point of view, we realize that all of it is interconnected and that the final battle here is directly dependent on the progress of the final battle in Zimbabwe, which is dependent upon the progress of the final battle in Israel which is dependent upon the progress of the final battle in Turkey and Saudi Arabia, right? The shifting of control away from the House of Saud, for example. Um, you know, these types of things directly impact all of the other sides of the net. It's like the spider's web of all spider webs. And so moving towards that November season, I don't believe we'll arrive at the election. And I believe the reason for that is because we will be experiencing enough localized chaos to have the attention of most of the United States and the world, potentially through a terrorist attack, which is what President Trump has said a number of different times, potentially through a red a, a, an activation of some sort of red dawn rising moment where you have the threat of nation state warfare brought right to the communities of American citizens. You know, this is not to alarm anyone, but this is to say that we will reach a point, I think, of localized chaos, not not national, but localized chaos that will be such that the electoral process will be suspended by the current resident administration. And I believe the reasoning for that could be a number of different things. It'll primarily include a wartime or a, or a number of wartime national emergencies and climate emergencies. We have the possibility of another biological emergency being declared as a result, excuse me, of the Parisian Olympics uh, that are just ahead of us over the summer. So looking at all that, when we see that sort of edict given, I think it would be safe to say that that's the point where the United States is no more and that we've descended into true tyranny and that, that if there is a patriotic component of the U.S. military that has been, you know, attempting to wait as long as it can before getting kinetically involved in a dramatic way, that would be the time at which that dramatic involvement would be not only appreciated, but welcomed and sought after by most, if not all of the true American population. Absolutely. And it's funny, SG, that you should mention Israel, because, as you probably know, they've already started their cursory attack on Rafah, next is Hezbollah, and then, of course, Iraq, Iran, in order to free up Iraq from the Iranian proxy government within Iraq, as well as the U.S. militias. So everything has a, a domino or a cataclysmic effect on the other, to your point. Um, you just put out a, uh, a recent, uh, I think, an article or video about uh, six of the 13 uh, family bloodlines tied to the Rothschilds and not the true Jews in Israel. Um, could you speak briefly on that and uh, about who those families are? Well, if you're referring to the, the papacy bloodlines, which I highlighted out, the dark papacy, you're talking about the Breakspears, the um, Medicis, the Colonnas, the Orsini bloodline. You know, these groups and these families go back very, very, they're very, they're very, very old. Um, they hail in, mo in the most recent time frame from the um, Central European and Italian nobilities of old. So think post-Constantinople, uh, around the time that the Western Roman Empire and Holy Roman Empire sort of became uh, a dual power situation. And so these nobilities constituted the aristocracy in a lot of Central and South Europe at the time, and also in uh, Spain and in France in later days, right? So the bloodline infiltration coming out of the Vatican um, is, is what you're expressly referring to. And the Rothschild bloodline actually came out of the Orsini bloodline, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I would encourage Anons out there to do a little bit of back research, <laughs> excuse me, on this exact topic, because it's a little bit nebulous. One of the best books to read is the 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati. That's the title of the book. Um, so when you when you look at the Orsini family, the Orsini family has been responsible for the black and gray popes um, at a number of different points along the way. These are the individuals that are at the top of the Jesuit order uh, within the Catholic Church. The Jesuit order exerts tremendous influence over the Synod, uh, which is that you know compendium of Catholic cardinals that determines the public facing direction of the Catholic Church. And so 
the Orsini family, uh, along with the Colonna and Medici family, have been heavily involved in that background manipulation of those forward-facing popes, the popes whose names we would actually recognize. And those families, excuse me, eventually got themselves through the Order of the Knights Templar in control of most of the, of the wealth of the developed post-Roman world. So the Rothschilds enter into the fold somewhere around the 16th, 17th century. Um, and actually, I think it was actually a little bit further back than that, towards the end of the 15th century, where a group, <coughs> excuse me, of Italian nobility married into um, some um, Ashkenazi Jewish transplants that had come from the area of what is now modern day Bulgaria and Turkey. And they rebranded their uh, name, taking the surname of the, I think it was a Germanic branch, uh, taking the surname of, of the of the Jewish, the Ashkenazi Jewish um, spouse. And so that surname was uh, Shield, S H or S C H I L D, Schilt in German. And the uh, addition of Rot, R O T, was added to that for Red Shield. So, Servant of Satan, Red Shield. Uh, that's why we have the Red Cross, for example, right? That's their, that's their way of sort of taking the piss at everybody in that regard against Christianity. Um, but the, the, uh, the decision was made that an H would be included in the name. Uh, to sort of misdirect, you know, individuals that were interested in finding about finding out more about where the family came from and who the bloodline of the family actually belonged to, and so out of that you get the phonetic progression Rothschild. So if we fast forward from that union between Italian nobility and this group of uh, Central European transplanted Ashkenazi Jews from several hundred years prior. And we fast forward to the 18th century, we get a, a gentleman named Meyer Amschel Rothschild. And this is one of the most important figures in the Rothschild dynasty. He certainly made all of his ancestors proud. He came up with the idea that if he could get his progeny and his offspring into the courts and into the beds of the aristocracy of Central and Western Europe, uh, to include the British crown, to include um, you know, this, the Spanish uh, uh, royalty that had descended, the, the French royalty at the time, this was immediately prior to the French Revolution, all of the different um, uh, fundamental pulpits of power in Europe. If he could get his progeny into those pulpits, he would have control of the financial direction of all of the developing world. And so, and he would have control also of the world's most powerful militaries. And this gentleman is on record actually dictating uh, to a to a um, a compendium of students, I believe it was, stating that if I have control of a nation's currency, then I don't care who writes the laws, and I don't need to worry myself about who writes the laws because whoever writes the laws is subservient to whoever holds, you know, the the purse strings. So, <clears throat> long story short, Mr. Rothschild and Meyer Amschel was very successful in this process, and the Rothschild maintained that close relationship to the Vatican in the background during the entirety of their financial subjugation of the developed world. So this would be 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. So coming back to your original question, where do those bloodlines tie into the Rothschilds, and why is this significant? Those bloodlines are your descended bloodlines from the Babylonian days of old and the Egyptian occultist schools of old that have maintained control of the world's uh, wealth, true wealth, uh, since the days of antiquity, right? You're talking about assets that you couldn't put a price on, uh, treasures from the library at Alexandria, right? Treasures from the conquests of Alexander the Great, um, you know, otherworldly treasures that were destroyed or damaged during cataclysms throughout history. These are the types of things that these bloodlines have possession of. It's not merely just the money. And so the Rothschilds are sort of the liaison family between the hidden families that control the true power, the true wealth, and yes, the true narrative behind most of modern religion's um, um, presentation, modern spiritual, you know, fellowships presentation of things. They're the liaison between that group and the public sphere. Absolutely. And thank you for doing a very deep dive breakdown on all the aspects of the bloodline family and how they intertwine to the point that you did. Um, and this might, this seems like a good place to stop for today, SG. Um, I'll tie this into your final thoughts because I, I, I would surmise that it probably is in line with, you know, your mentality having worked with you the last several shows now. 
Uh, and that is to say that people are tired, they're on the edge, they're financially at a tipping point, all very understandable. They see prices going up everywhere they look, so much so it seems that this is a systemic effect that people in New York City and throughout the country just wholesale not paying their taxes or unable or unwilling to pay their bills because it's just piling on too much and they're tired of seeing their hard-earned money go to uh, the corrupt U.S. government corporation, which is using, as you know, Ukraine as a money laundering event for sex trafficking and drugs and all the nefarious behaviors that they're notorious for doing. Um, what, what signs of encouragement overall as a summation can you give people that can't see a way through right now to the other side? You know, John, I keep telling patriots that when you're in a warfare scenario and you're under fire and it's a hot zone, you have to remember to appreciate not only where you're at, whether it's undesirable or desirable, but also how far you've come. If you've advanced up the battlefield several hundred yards and you're still taking fire, but you're still advancing, that's actually positive. That's forward movement. It may not feel like forward movement. It certainly may be rife with trepidation and frightfulness and you know, even outright terror in some degrees, but it is still forward progress on the battlefield. And the mission here is the overall uh, translation of one system, transmutation really of one system into another. So when we examine how far we've come, we have a lot of positivity and a lot of encouragement to draw from on that. We have lived now halfway through, nearly halfway through the 16th year of the 16 year plan to destroy America. And yet we are all here. Uh, from what I understand, the um, populations of the world at large are waking up more rapidly every single day. I'm getting new feeds coming in from all different platforms describing individuals you know, that, that have come about to the realization of what's truly at play just in the last four weeks. Uh, so that's, I think, a, another thing to remember is we're multiplying our numbers and we're growing our numbers constantly throughout this process. We have seen the capitulation of AstraZeneca. We have seen the preservation of free speech worldwide and meteoric growth uh, on the X platform and in alternative platforms. Truth Social is the fastest growing platform within the United States territorially. So between those two, we have essentially an information atom bomb of our own that we're able to uh, wage total war with against the the lying propaganda manipulation machine that is the media and the controlled information complex, you know. And I just highlighted recently on File seventy four that DHS has put out more than a thousand press releases regarding the arrests of pedophiles and sex trafficking rings, going back two to three years now, uh, just since the installation of the Biden uh, Manchurian residency. So we have a lot john that we have accomplished we have a lot of progress that we've made we've gotten a lot of webs exposed we've gotten a lot of territorial control either destabilized or shifted completely we've gotten a lot excuse me done with regards to the elimination of bioterrorist capable laboratories and pathogens that are outside of u.s law and u.s control and that's actually been on behalf quite frankly excuse me, and we owe thanks, I think, to a great many other nations that were willing to risk the lives of their soldiers and their men and their civilian populations to clean up the terrorism that had been happening uh, on behalf of our government, of course, unbeknownst to all of us here in America. So this is a fantastic time to be alive. I can't wait to see what comes out of the Epstein Islands, uh, uh, excuse me, of the, the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, Third Circuit investigation right now into the corruption behind the Virgin Islands government. We know that the Epstein group is heavily entrenched in control, essentially, of the Virgin Islands and of manipulation of the constitutional Third Circuit. And that exposure is yet to is, is still yet to happen. Um, we've got indications from all over the planet that the U.S. dollar is finally beginning to crack, that there are uh, that, that water is coming through the seams and we're not going to be able to put it back out of this ship. And so while undesirable for Americans in the very short term, that's actually a great thing long term because it gets the constrictor out from around our neck. So this is a fantastic time, I think, to acknowledge where we're at, how far we've come, and to also remember that this is a dynamic conflict. It is a battle between good and evil. We are winning that battle that it takes all of us, it truly does take the army, and that if you are having a low morale kind of day, it would probably be advisable to disconnect a little bit, uh, to get back into nature if you can, go outside, get some breaths underneath the sun. 
if you're a, a person of faith, try and get in touch with your spiritual component, your spiritual side, and remember that we're all chosen for such a time as this. You are muted, my friend. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, SG, for the uh, salient information and the genuine encouragement. Um, where can people find out about you? Because I know that there's a lot of copycat sites of your work. I can be found at three authentic places online. I'm on rumble.com at the handle Q News Patriot. So it's rumble.com slash user slash Q News Patriot. I'm not on Rumble by SG Anon. I am on uh, X, formerly Twitter, at the handle T, or excuse me, the T H E Q News Patriot with a username of SGNON, and it has a blue check mark. And then I can be found on Truth Social at the handle real R E A L S G N O N with a red check mark. Excellent. And folks, uh, we're having the same issue where people are copycatting our page and trying to pass it off as legitimate. It is not us. We are only here on YouTube under uh, Chris Worldworld and myself, my, my name under. Uh, bit shoot and rumble and of course our true social john dowling club patriot this is exactly why we've created club patriot is to give you the genuine article away from copycats and trolls and bots and would be uh, pirates online uh, so we recommend that you take a visit to club patriot uh, the discord portion of the chat that's free is almost ready to go live here in the next week or two we're being told and also we have the business side, if you're looking to create streams of income or connect with other business owners, healing solutions and the like. You heard SG talking about uh, the inevitable march for the reset uh, as it relates to the bonds and foreign currencies. So if you are interested in getting some of those mechanisms or bonds or currencies, we'll leave a link for both at the description at the end of the, the podcast. Thanks SG for your time. We look forward to having you on again next month. Thank you, my friend. God bless and stay safe. You we'll too. get there. You as well.